Well, everybody, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Verhoeve, and I work as the Executive Director of the Business and Education Partnership of Waterloo Region. Uh, we're a local charity that helps uh, young people in our community explore and experience careers. Uh, we want to begin by acknowledging that we're broadcasting from the traditional uh, territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral people. We honour and respect the First Peoples of Canada and strive to learn from their example. We also wish to thank the sponsors who have made this series possible, including Toyota Motor Manufacturing Canada, Sonova Canada, the Region of Waterloo, the Workforce Planning Board of Waterloo Wellington Dufferin, and the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Programs of the Waterloo Region and Waterloo Catholic District School Boards. Finally, I want to thank each of you for joining us tonight. Uh, I have been talking uh, with young people about making career choices for over a decade, and uh, it can be a very overwhelming um, process for a lot of folks. So learning from people uh, who have gone through this process uh, is a really great way to get some clarity uh, around the next steps you can take. And through this school year, we're gonna be running six of these evening sessions with um, uh, community members uh, here in Waterloo Region. So tonight's session features four local artists who will be sharing about what they do and how they got to where they are. Um, they're gonna be introducing themselves for a few minutes as we get started here and uh, have people uh, coming in. And uh, then they'll be taking your questions. So I would encourage you um, as the session progresses to um, ask any questions that you ha might have into the Q&A. Uh, you might be wondering if you're visible right now, but uh, you're not, this is a webinar. So um, in, in this style, uh, we can't see you, you can just see us and the panelists. So if you do have any questions, we'd encourage you to ask them and you can just type them into that Q&A uh, box down at the bottom of your, your Zoom window there. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite our panelists on camera. Uh, so um, those folks, uh, as they hear me uh, uh, saying that, can turn their cameras on. Um, we have this, this evening Adam Bowman, who's a professional musician, uh, specifically a percussionist, or uh, also known as a drummer. Uh, Adam's a touring musician and also a teacher. Thanks, Adam, for joining us. We have uh, Agnes uh, Nua Dom Domsky. Uh, she's an artist, an educator, and director, and owner of a small business called Mindful Makers. Welcome, Agnes. You can, you can do the little wave. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andrew Kolb is a self-employed author, illustrator, and game designer. Hi, Andrew. And uh, we have uh, Nicole uh, DeCole. She's a wardrobe supervisor for Drayton Entertainment, as well as the owner of a tailoring business called Loose Threads. Love the name, and thanks for joining us, Nicole. So uh, I, uh, I warned uh, the panelists beforehand that we're going to uh, begin in alphabetical order. So um, each of the panelists are going to take a few minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, tell us a again a little bit about uh, who they are, what they do, how they got into their work, uh, and then we'll open again up to, uh, to everyone's questions. So uh, Adam, you're the first name that starts with A, so I'm going to let you take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Adam Bowman. And I'm a professional musician, drummer. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I spend my life either touring or recording with different artists, uh, many different styles of music. I'm what's called a freelance musician. Uh, it's like being a contract worker. So I get uh, different different contracts for different things. It might be a tour, it might be a, an album, uh, it might just be a one night concert. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be able to do that for the last 20 years or so. Um, I've toured all over the world many times with lots of different people um, and uh, had wonderful experiences, uh, been to the Junos a few times, and um, uh, but ultimately been able to pay my bills and uh, support my family through playing music. Uh, I also teach drums at the University of Guelph. I live here in Guelph. Um, I'm from Elmira, Ontario. I went to EDSS there. And that's where I that's where I started playing. I didn't start playing the drums until I was in about uh, grade nine, grade ten. That's when it really began for me. And uh, yeah, I always I always struggle in talking about it like a career or a job um, because it's it's made up of many different types of jobs. Like I said, sometimes touring or recording, sometimes teaching. Uh, I also accompany modern dance organizations here in Guelph. I, I'm an accompanist. They train with live percussion, so I'm their accompanist. Um, 
and uh, I facilitate workshops. I work with uh, different organizations um, doing arts-based facilitation. Uh, so it's it's really many jobs and, and what it really has ultimately become is that um, it's more of a it's a it's a lifestyle rather than a career. It's a way that I've chose to sort of show up in the world in an artful way um, rather than like a career with a very specific sort of role and salary and um, procedure to get there and so on. So uh, I did go to Humber College. I studied drums there for a while. I was there for about a year and a half. And then I got some opportunities to start touring. And so um, that's where it really all began for me. And ever since then, it's been um, continuing to make those choices about, yeah, how to move through the world in an artful way. And it's taken me some pretty incredible places with some, some really amazing people. And um, I'm just thrilled that I get to, um, for the most part, play drums every day in one way, shape or form and uh, support my family. I, I'm, I have a wife and I have a three year old daughter. So um, and they often get to come on the road with me as well, which is also a, a beautiful bonus that I get to share this artful way of being with um, with my family. So anyways, I'm sure we'll talk more about that as it goes on, but I'll pass it off to whoever shows up next alphabetically. This way, that way, maybe this way. That'll be me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, so my name is Agnes and I'm the owner and director of Mindful Makers. So if you haven't heard about us, um, we're quite a small business and located in Kitchener, Waterloo. Um, but my upbringing is actually, I grew up in Hamilton and my whole life, I always knew I wanted to be an artist of some type. Uh, I had, I originally thought when I was younger, I'd have two jobs. One would be a greeting card designer um, and the other would be I'd be an animator for Disney. So none of, neither of those really panned out, <laughs> but in a roundabout way, I kind of get to do everything um, in my job. So what I actually do um, besides running like the day-to-day -day business, the, the core thing that I really love to do and I'm really passionate about is like inventing craft projects and teaching people hands-on skills. So primarily Mindful Makers um, runs kids camps in the form of summer camps and PD days and March breaks. Um, but we also do adult events and we do festivals so the public can come in and interact with our hands-on maker stations or interact with our big art installations. Um, so my training um, is actually as a fine artist and um, I, I actually studied at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. Um, and that was a number of years ago now. So during my time at OCAD, I was learning all sorts of hands-on skills. So everything from wood shop to fiber arts, um, you know, fine art stuff too. So writing about like fine art. And, and through that whole four years of my undergrad, um, I got a really good foundation in like all things art, I guess. Um, I really, really love my time there. And, and sort of at the end of coming out of graduating, um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do next. Um, I just, I knew that like I was on the right path. I knew I loved creating with my hands um, and sort of the teaching aspect sort of came after the fact. Um, I have always been interested in, in teaching people, but I never wanted to be like a typical school teacher um, just because I knew that I probably couldn't do exactly what I wanted to do because <laughs> uh, I was always told like, you know, arts are not supported. You're going to have to teach some other subjects and I really love the idea of being my own boss um, and having a creative idea and being able to just kind of implement it and, and put it out into the world. So I've been kind of working away at that for the last five years. Um, so since 2016, I've been running the business and it's really just all I think about. It's uh, like 24 seven. It's kind of like when you're an entrepreneur, it's funny. There's a joke that they say like, oh, you didn't want to work nine to five. So now you work 24 seven for yourself. <laughs> that kind of, it's kind of feels like that, but I can't imagine myself doing anything other than that. So it's, uh, I just, I really love it. And I think you have to be like suited to that kind of work if you're going to be going down the entrepreneurial path. Um, and I have a lot of supporters. My best friend um, kind of got me started. She runs her own small business running camps um, for kids uh, teaching French. So similar um, and I'm able to have like a mentor to guide me along the way um, and through all of that yeah it's really I don't know I find it really fulfilling um, I'm able to just like have an idea like 
I'm gonna like this, I started laying crochet. Here's a little pumpkin I'm working on right now. So <laughs> it's like nonstop, like being able to like think, oh, I wanna learn that or I wanna teach that. So you just kind of like, you work away at it, put it out into the world, see how people respond to it. Um, and then you just like figure out what works and you keep, you, you just keep trying stuff. And the past year and a half, we've been trying a lot of different things. Um, and one thing I'm really excited to share with you guys is that um, we just launched our TV show. So that's kind of been a, been a little bit of my pandemic project. Um, we created a TV show last summer um, with the hopes that it would just be part of our kits that we we're selling um, because for at home making, uh, we needed some, some kind of programming and I really wanted it to be like a little TV show. And so it was picked up this year by Rogers TV and Cable 14 in Hamilton. So that's starting to air now and you guys can always tune in and watch it. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a fun thing that's come out of all of this like crazy stressful time. So there you go. <laughs> On to the next one. I think that's, I think that's me and I don't know how I'm going to follow a TV show. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Kolb. Um, I'm an author and illustrator and game designer, uh, like was introduced. Um, so I guess starting earliest on, I'd illustrated or always it was like drawing with crayons as a kid and then that carried over into high school where I kind of like focused on fine art um and I went to Grand River Collegiate so if anybody who's living in Kitchener uh, then that's where I that's my alma mater maybe I don't know if that applies to high school um and in high school we had um uh, a group of students come from Conestoga College and they explained kind of what graphic design was which was great because I think, uh, well, like Agnes, I think my plan was to become a, a Disney animator uh, or that was my goal for using my illustration skills um, or my love of art, um, but had no idea how to, how to do that. And, and graphic design felt like a much more attainable and practical goal. Because uh, I think as much as I've always loved uh, kind of using or kind of wanting to make a career out of art, I think I, I didn't want to live the kind of what kind of like TV and movies would show as kind of like the starving artist lifestyle that just, that wasn't for me. So uh, graphic design seemed to be the kind of more uh, stable version of that uh, where, you know, you would work for someone and have like consistent employment and all the things that I, I kind of wanted out of a career, but also kind of like expressing myself creatively. Uh, and for those who don't want to know what graphic design is, it's essentially like layout, typography, illustration. It's kind of like, if you think of a magazine or an app, it's like kind of all the stuff, how, how it all gets there. Um, you're the person who kind of takes the photography or takes the, the copy and lays it out and kind of arranges it. And I did that for a number of years. Uh, I went through three years of college. They had a bridge program in Australia. So I did an extra year in Brisbane um, so I could get my degree because my other plan was to work as a graphic designer for 30, 40 plus years, and then kind of transition in with my years of wisdom, become a, a teacher uh, and kind of teach graphic design. So I went, to, I went to school, kind of got my degree, came back, started working in design studios, and then an opening opened up at the college where I went to school uh, and knowing that I had recently graduated and got my degree that I could teach. So I applied with only kind of like a handful of years of experience as a graphic designer but teaching illustration because I was always kind of the, the design student who like some loved photography, some loved typography, but I was always the one who liked to draw. Um, so I came back and started teaching illustration while also working in a, in a studio as a graphic designer. And then as I'm kind of like dedicatedly kind of learning more and more about illustration and kind of teaching the, the course that I wish I would have gotten um, as a part-time teacher, then I start branching out into illustration. So uh, at one point I'm spinning three plates of illustration, graphic design and, uh, and teaching. Um, and where illustration kind of separates from graphic design is that illustration is exclusively the like drawing or creating of the artwork that the graphic designers then kind of take and use elsewhere. Uh, so if you think of a book, um, then I would be illustrating the pages, but the graphic designer is the one who then takes that, that artwork and then puts the, the story around it. Or if it's a, a novel, then lays out the text with the cover illustration. Uh, so 
moving away from graphic design, I was then focusing more on illustration and teaching. Uh, and then after a number of years of teaching, moved more towards exclusively illustration. Um, and as you'll kind of get from this story, I changed, have changed a lot of uh, kind of like components of my career uh, kind of in reaction to kind of what was kind of like pulling me or what I was kind of like passionate about. Um, so as I kind of weaned off of teaching, then I started illustrating almost exclusively and kind of working closer to kind of with the lifestyle that Adam described with uh, kind of like self-employment and kind of just like a kind of living illustration. Um, and that lent itself to kind of like picture books and uh, the greeting cards that Agnes was talking about, like it's, uh, it's kind of like jobs from everywhere. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to do is write my own stories. Um, so I started with uh, a kind of a, a, a picture book because it had the fewest number of words and the highest number of illustrations, uh, which was kind of like the balance that I was most comfortable with. Uh, and I have prompts. Um, so this was kind of my first book, which is Edmund Unravels, uh, which is about a ball of yarn who likes to kind of travel, but as he travels, gets smaller and needs to kind of roll, uh, come home and get rolled back up. Inspired by, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, inspired by my trip to Australia and kind of like missing home and kind of that feeling of kind of uh, longing for kind of that familiarity. And then that book led to a second book. And then those two books that I had written and illustrated led to uh, kind of illustrating for other people, which I really enjoy. Uh, and kind of one of the ones I'm most proud of is, is this one, which is uh, Spider-Man Swings Through Europe, which is uh, tied into the movie. Uh, so I get to work with now as a kind of a, a freelance illustrator, work with a bunch of different kind of clients like Marvel and Disney and essentially the, the folks with the most amount of money in the world. Um, they make books um, and that has then transitioned into and kind of consistently doing books and illustration um, has then led me to kind of working more in game design because when I'm not illustrating and talking about illustration, I'm often playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so much like kind of wanting to do a picture book and kind of like kind of putting that out into the world, I wanted to write a world that people could play D&D &D in. Um, so I started working on it and then working with folks that I know in the kind of industry then pitched that idea. And so this is I, I more props. Uh, so this is my kind of like book based on the world of Neverland, which is uh, uh, like a setting for Dungeons and Dragons. And there's like a bunch of illustrations and maps that I am never comfortable drawing. I'm more, I'm more into characters than I am to maps, but you got to do it. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I'm at now is kind of doing game design, illustration for books, uh, still the greeting cards, like all of that kind of like, uh, kind of like just like, like a snowball. Like as I keep going, I kind of like take another thing from somewhere and add it to the stuff that I do. So it's, it's never a dull moment. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's me. That's Andrew Cole. So, uh, Nicole. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that all very, very tough acts to follow. Um, I'm Nicole, I am in theater. I am the assistant head of wardrobe for Drayton Entertainment. And I also own my own business, which I called Loose Threads. Um, I have been doing theater since I was in my mom's womb. She was pregnant with me doing a stage managing West Side Story. Um, my parents, along with their friends, about almost 40 years ago, started Jam Drama and KW. And so when I was little, I was running around backstage when they were putting on small productions in town. I was helping out with sets. I was a kid in Charlie Brown. Um, so I always loved doing theater. But like Agnes said, I was never going to do theater or never going to do this as my job. I had two other careers in mind. I was either going to be a teacher or I was going to be a marine biologist. Two very, very different things from the creative world that I'm in now. Um, but when I got to high school, I remember my parents always talking about how they loved being on their tech crews, and that's where JM Drama came from. It stands for um, St. Jerome, St. Mary's um, Productions, because they, they were both, when they were in school, boys went to one school, girls went to the other school, um, so, but they would come together to do the, the productions at, uh, at uh, their high school, so it was just easier to do a joint venture, and then when they graduated, there wasn't enough kids in the following year to do um, a really good tech crew. So their um, drama teacher, Bill Kloss, asked some of the students to come back and help out the new kids so that they could learn to do what my parents and their friends had done. And from there, they had such a fantastic time that they wanted to start something. So they started Jam. 
Um, so with that in mind, when I got to high school, I really wanted to join my high school tech crew because I wanted to make memories of my of my own and doing the things that my parents really loved and hoping that maybe it would be something I would love on the side and have fun doing. Um, and as I went through school, I was still going to either be a teacher or a marine biologist. I took um, co-op courses and all of that fun stuff to get used to those ideas, but I always had theater as uh, my backdrop. And then when it came to my final year uh, of pick to, to, to decide to pick a school, I was like, no, I like those two other options, but I really just have developed love for the arts and for theater. And I think I'm going to go there. And I remember my dad taking me aside and going, you are going to starve for the first 10 years of your life. But I thought, you know what? That's okay. Cause I love what I do and I want to, I want to have a go at it. It's, it's kind of, I, I have to go there. So from, from high school, I went to Ryerson University for technical uh, production and I majored in wardrobe. And I did a minor in history because I thought history was, it's, it's the bomb, I love history. But it also really helps with what I do because a lot of the productions I put on, um, you have to have a little bit of history to know what clothes go with what uh, play and what genre. Um, so I was there for four years and on the side, I would do some productions uh, in Toronto. I went to, uh, all the way up to Banff for one summer to do the uh, Banff Festival out there. And we did ballet, ballet training and opera, which was, it's a different world than what I do. Musical theater and, and Broadway style is, is what I work in, but to work in ballet and, and opera, it's, it's crazy. Um, excuse me. The main thing with opera is it's a big, big production for four days because it takes a lot out of those performers. So you kind of have all of this to come together and then it's four days and then that's it. But a lot of the opera singers, they do that show for years, but just in different venues. Um, when I graduated university, I literally wrote my final exam on a Friday and I moved up to Grand Bend to work for Drayton on the Monday. And I've been working for Drayton Entertainment since 2007. I started as a stitcher. And what that means is I sew all the clothes. And then I also was a dresser. And that means that when the show is happening, I'm backstage helping actors to change into their next costume. If there's a quick change, I'm helping to literally get them out of one costume into, into another. And I think my fastest quick change was about 15 seconds. It was, uh, it was kind of crazy. There was four of us. And sometimes the guy went on a little disheveled, but most of the time we got him quite perfect. And we were always so proud um, when we did that. Um, the next year I moved up to first hand. And the first hand is someone who helps the cutter. The cutter is the person who cuts out all the clothing. And I help in the, uh, the fittings and I help direct all the stitchers into what they're doing. And then after that, I became the assistant head of wardrobe and I've been that ever since. Um, and what that basically means is I am, all, there's two of us in my position and we take turns um, heading the, the wardrobe department on a show. So we are the go-between between between the director and the designer and the actors. Um, we are in every single fitting. We are in every single meeting about uh, creative ideas and how we can make that happen, what the director envisions, what the designer envisions and making those um, ideas mesh because sometimes the director is going to see one way and the de designer is going to see another way and we have to make sure that there is a very cohesive vision in the end and my job is to is to kind of help them be a melting pot together and, and get something that they're both proud and happy about out. Um, excuse me, I help do all the paperwork and paperwork is a big part of my job. I know it's not glamorous in the world of theater or in the world of arts, but it's really important that when we hit dress rehearsal I have all of the information so that every single actor knows where they're going, when they're changing, what side of the stage they're changing on, what side of the stage they're entering on, and how much time they have to change. Um, and it also helps the dressers backstage because then they know where they have to be as soon as that change is happening. They have like they have a watch on. They can also listen to certain musical cues. Um, and so I've been doing that. And then I also sometimes do uh, costume design for the shows, which is really great. I I love being able to get uber creative and have some fun with that. Um, and then when I was on maternity leave with my second daughter, I thought it would be great to start my own tailoring business at home because I was I was kind of bored sitting at home. Not that I don't love my children. <laughs> it's fun and it's, it's it's a different part of my life, but I wanted to keep kind of doing something on the side. So I start, I started Loose Threads and it's a home, it's tailoring business. I do bridesmaids dresses. I alter um, shirts, suits, clothes, pretty much you name it, I do it. I've also created a lot of things for people. I just did the wedding dress. Um, I create dirndls for uh, for people, especially in the KW region. We are a big German community with Oktoberfest. So sometimes people don't always see what they have on stock. So I 
they get an idea, we go pick up some fabric and I make that. And uh, since the pandemic, my business has gotten pretty busy. People have not been able to shop as much or there's a lot of online shopping that doesn't always come with the style or the size advertised. So we, we alter that because not no one is, in my belief, no one is off the rack. Everyone is unique and that's fantastic. And I like to help people feel the best in their clothes and make that work for them because it's it's really easy not to. So I like to make sure everything is is exactly what they want it to be. And that's me. Someone was going to have to start talking while they're muted and it was me. Um, yeah, that was wonderful. Thanks so much to each of you. Um, I didn't realize there'd be so much yarn. Yeah, I think yarn came up then. <laughs> At least three of those. Uh, I bet Adam's got some yarn at his house too. Uh, <laughs> somewhere, maybe the kids' room. Um, anyhow, um, so uh, we've gotten to know uh, our, our panelists here, um, and this is an opportunity now for uh, the, the folks in the audience to uh, ask their questions. Uh, so again, um, we can't see you, but we'd love for you to type them into the Q and A. And um, there's a, a few, uh, <laughs> there's a few that have come in here, and uh, a few that we can get started asking. So uh, start thinking about your questions if you haven't yet, um, and uh, we'll we'll. So basically, I'll, I'll ask those two our panelists here. So far, one person says, Andrew, I have you want to say I have your book Edmund Unravels and I love it. That's great. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, one question here. Um, can you folks tell us about what you would say would be the advantages or disadvantages of working in your in your industry? And whoever would like to start can go first. I guess I'll go first. Um... The advantages of working in my theater or in my industry is I I get to do what I love every day. And I think that's being creative is awesome. And I think it's a really great outlet for doing it. And I get to work with so many fantastic people like Adam. I also work with musicians, um, actors, directors, and I get to work with so many different people that I wouldn't necessarily meet on a regular basis. The disadvantages of is sometimes it's, it's their long days. You really have to love what you do to stay survive in this industry as long as you can because it is like there are days I'm working 18 to 20 hours and I have two small children at home and there are times when I'm going from between seven different theaters there was a time when I was helping to put tours out and it was it's long days and you're gone for you know days weeks at a time and you don't get to see your loved ones um I'm not as lucky as that I wasn't able to take my family on tour with me so it's 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 a drawback at times to be gone, especially when my kids are so young to not see them for about a week or so, but I love to do video chats with them. So that's, those are my pros and cons of my working. I can share. I was also answering a question to the side that was directed specifically towards me. So uh, for illustration, I guess I'll focus maybe specifically on illustration. I think maybe some of this overlaps with just kind of like being freelance in general. Um, I think uh, when Agnes was talking about working 24 seven, I think one of the challenges is uh, kind of like separating work from literally everything else. Like I think um, long ago when I was single and hungry and just kind of like wanted to work, then I could, like I could work seven days a week until bed and when I get up in the morning um, and I think there was a time when I was okay with that because uh, I think, um, especially kind of when you're first establishing yourself, I think there is kind of like a steep learning curve or just kind of like adjustment period for like kind of starting your own business um, that kind of like requires the momentum of putting a lot in. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be seven days a week, uh, 12 hour days, but I think it, it takes more than what you will hopefully have 10 years into the industry. Um, so. Uh, I think one of the challenges still is not slipping back into the mindset of, oh, if I work on Saturday and Sunday, then I'll be further ahead on Monday. Um, I think it's, it's finding a balance of, I need enough to kind of like support myself and my family and, and kind of like continue this as a career without it becoming the only thing in your life. Um, and this is maybe getting too kind of like heady or philosophical. It's essentially like, I think what I'm running into or like what I'm suggesting is a big challenge with self-employment in general is balancing the, the kind of like on switch versus the off switch. Um, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna say I have the answer but I think that's something that I definitely kind of like consider uh, kind of at every stage of, of kind of working, yeah. 
I will add to that. <laughs> um, I would say that um, the to-do list never ends, like it's always going to be there. And that's for anybody in any industry, <laughs> not just creatives. Um, so recognizing that, yeah, having your time off is really important for resting and recharging. Um, but I wanted to say about the the benefits of being your own boss are pretty great because it's like you're the boss you don't got to answer to anyone else um but on the flip side it's like nothing gets done unless you do it <laughs> so um you have to be pretty disciplined i guess you i could say like no one's um like waiting on me to do things like if i hi i hire employees and i'm constantly worried that like they're waiting on me to get back to them so I'm almost like in service to them. <laughs> like it's like a reciprocal thing. Like I gotta make sure they have what they need so that they can support the project. Um, so yeah, having employees is interesting. Um, I get to hire people uh, a few times during the year um, through Canada Summer Jobs. So I get the granting through the government and that really helps me out a lot. Typically it's been through the summertime, um, but because of the pandemic, um, I've been able to stretch those people, those jobs out a little bit into the, the fall winter season this year. So yeah, it's been, it's been good to have because, because I am the only one technically running the business. It's good to have that fresh energy coming in. So I really love that opportunity of like getting to um, like interview people and, and kind of train them into like the way that I want them to like understand my visions. So that's a lot of work too. It's like, I know what I want to do in my head, but like having, like getting that across to someone else and like kind of training them in a way that's like, yeah, like I want you to like be work collaborating together with me and, and let's like see this through um, to the end in a way that we're all both satisfied with. So that's also a cool part of the job. <laughs> I had a question come in here in the Q and A that, that uh, sort of pertains to what we're chatting about. Is that all right if I address that? Um, I was thinking of asking it. Connected to Bye. this, so yeah, go for it. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think we'll leave the askers anonymous. I think that's the idea. But the, the question is essentially, um, was there ever a time in your life where you wanted to give up? What did you do to bounce back and continue pursuing your dream? What did you whisper to yourself when heavily influenced? And I think some of the wording in this question is really interesting. Um, it's, kind of, it's three questions there, but the first one uh, is, is quite easy. Is there ever a time in your life when you wanted to give up? Yes, regularly and often. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's definitely one of the, if we're talking about pros and cons of a life in, in the arts, that's definitely one of them is that you essentially lay your soul bare for everyone to critique and, and, um, and pick apart and uh, chime in on, um, adjudicate. Um, yeah, you're putting very vulnerable parts of your of yourself out there, and that that can be hard. Um, and sometimes the uh, what comes back is not always the most positive and encouraging stuff in the world, and that can that can weigh on you, and that can be heavy. Um, and so, yeah, you can consider like maybe maybe this isn't <laughs> what I want to do <laughs> if this is the type of emotional toll that this is going to take. Um, um, what did you do to bounce back and continue pursuing your dream? This is the wording that I thought was interesting. When people always talk about pursuing a dream or finding success, that suggests that there's an end point to this thing that we're doing, that we're working towards. Like there is some sort of a larger dream or larger goal or, or larger measure of success. And this is what I was saying at the beginning is that the dream that I am pursuing, I'm actually currently living. This was the dream. The dream was to be able to wake up every day and be able to play music and play the drums and make music that I believe in with people that I respect um, for an audience that is appreciative. Um, so this is not a some point in the future that I am hoping to get to or some measure of financial success or if I win enough awards or if I play on a record that sells enough copies. This is success is not something that's down the road. It's not based in hope. It's based in success is based in right now and today. And so it took me a long time to get to that sort of realization that that all of these little measures of success kind of evaporate in your hands. It's like a mirage in the desert. You think, well, if I just do this, and then you get there and you realize that there's more and then you get to the next thing and then it disappears and like sand in your hands, you, you never get there. So I don't need to whisper 
words of encouragement to myself to keep going to this forward point in the future of success or a dream. As long as I understand that this is currently my dream, this is currently um, something that I'm living, that I'm not pursuing. Uh, it's that I said, like I said at the beginning, I proceeding in an artful way. The point that I'm hoping to reach is here, um, if that's helpful at all. But as to whether or not you want to give up, absolutely, because the costs are great. Um, in any career, in any occupation, there's costs, uh, but these costs are, are, are great and, they, um, and they, they can take a toll. They can be a heavy load and hopefully through your art, you find a way to sort of alleviate a bit of the load and uh, you can enjoy the, the highs and the lows. I think that's, that's my biggest uh, piece of advice is that there will be lows and there will be highs. And uh, to just be where you are, I think is the most important part in that whole sort of never ending roller coaster ride. That's life, really. There. Too heavy? I'm not sure. There you go. Oh, uh, that was good. I almost feel like we have to just end it there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Don't leave. Um, I, there was a good question that came in while you were answering as well, Adam, which I think is maybe a good, a good segue from, from your response there. Um, uh, the question is, who are your biggest role models slash inspirations during your career? Um, you know, that might be part of how people uh, figure out how to, you know, get where they want to be and um, you know, figure out what they want to do and, and also find that, you know, inspiration when things are difficult. So, um, Question again, who are your biggest role models and inspirations during your career? I can do mine real fast. Bruce Lee, Prince, Alfred Hitchcock. Those are the three. You'll notice that only one of those is a musician. Artful people. I'll, I'll add to that only because I have a pretty simple, but also fairly different answer. I think, uh, I don't know if I have a specific role model, but I think what usually inspires me is seeing someone who is not necessarily good at something, but like passionate about it. Uh, I think that always kind of like drives me to come back and find kind of what am I, what I'm passionate about. Um, and I think being inquisitive by nature, I'm always like interested to find out more from that person when they're talking about how much they love uh, kind of like woodworking or something that I, not that I have no interest in it, but I have no kind of experience in it uh, and kind of learning from them and seeing kind of the world through their eyes. Those are, that's kind of who I kind of aspire to kind of uh, like emulate or kind of continue to, to be is to be someone who is curious and also kind of passionate about what I'm doing. And then if I'm not, then figuring out how I can change that. Like if I'm not enjoying a project, then asking what can I, what can I do to change? Um, and sometimes I forget to ask those questions until I see someone who is either in a completely different industry who really kind of like frames it as you're drawing pictures all day. What are you worried about? Or someone who is just like so passionate about uh, pond cleaning that I'm like, oh, I, I like, I don't get it. What are you, how are you doing this? And then that kind of like love of what they're doing kind of like ignites that fire for me again that I try to take that away. Uh, and bring that back to my own kind of like practice or living. So maybe an abstract answer, I'll, I'll recede. <laughs> but that's, I, that's, that's what I would say. I'm inspired by folks who love Those what are the they best do. answers, man. It's a room full of artists. What kind of answers? <laughs> oh, yeah, get, you're right. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah, right. Come on. Agnes, remember Nicole, just give you a second in case you want to chime in, but you don't, you don't have to. We've got lots more questions coming in here. Um, my biggest role model was Tim Burton. Um, I loved everything he did. Um, I love that he wasn't afraid to be kooky and quirky. And I was watching a documentary actually recently about how they made The Nightmare Before Christmas. And there was called like Tim Burton style in regards to how the animators drew things, how they did things. So I just, he, he made it okay for me to be weird and geeky and nerdy and quirky and apply that to different aspects of my life where I thought I had to be um, straight laced, I guess you could call it, and just allow me to be like, no, I'm gonna go do this and it's fine with that. And I just loved that, you know, being able to be you and 
not apologize for it. And uh, I think, yeah, that was that. And then watching, pretty much watching all of the show, like the movies, TV shows, like just looking at those, not even looking for the entertainment value of it per se, but just watching it going, I wonder how they did that. I wonder how they made that. That would be so cool. Just wanting to put myself in any position in the arts to be creative going, how did they make that prop or did, how did they do that sound cue? How did, how did they learn to play that piece? Like just pretty much everything that I saw inspired me to want to continue to be on this path and really love it. And even take with the negatives kind of go forward and be like, eh, that's cool. I'm good with that. I like it. You know what else I love about Tim Burton too, is that he also really demonstrates that great art is often made in community. Oh yeah. So pay attention to Tim's pieces. Mm -hmm. There's the same people that are showing up all the time. Helena Bonham Carter and Johnny Depp and Danny Elfman's been doing his soundtracks for years and years and years. And he's really started to develop his own, like a gravity that just attracts these like-minded individuals. And and he understands that it's it's bigger than him. He brings these, these people that he trusts and he respects. And it's a, a community that makes these incredible projects together. And I imagine if, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Nicole could speak to it more than I, but I imagine a lot of the <laughs> costume designers are, uh, similar and like a lot of the same faces are showing up and you know yeah, the community nature of his work I find is really interesting as well oh totally I completely agree it's it is gravitating towards someone that you can kind of agree with and see and then like-mindedness like Adam said and it's just it's great to see that kind of come together and inspire you to be more so I guess I will chime in with my my role model. Um, so the only person I could think of when this question came up was my dad. Um, and because growing up, you know, he was always fixing everything around the house. He'd remodeled every single room in our house. He was like the handyman, right? And like he fixed it, like he could do anything. And, um, you know, there was a big moment in my life in high school, actually, when he was in a car accident. And so that was this like pivotal moment of my life where everything changed. And, and so I guess kind of through that, like, I've always had this idea of him, like before the accident, like almost like, you know, you, you see someone and your memories in a different way than you never knew what, like, what could happen if, if, if it never happened. Um, so I always like have this vision of him, of, like me as a little girl looking up to him and, and just seeing like he took care of us. And, and so he's always been like sort of my role model and through every, like all my education, my growing up, all the things I do, I always, I always have him in my heart. So that's kind of my answer. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Agnes. Yeah. Um, there is a, another question I'm going to kind of riff off of here. Someone asked about, you know, specific courses or or training. Um, I'm going to ask more generally the question to the group here. Um, are, are there things that you'd recommend um, people do in terms of developing their craft, you know, whether that's, or in this case, your craft, um, whether that is like a formal programs or, or courses or just other things that you do that you found help you sort of develop your, your skills? Yeah, I could, I could start because someone that was asking me about, um, uh, something similar. Uh, and I think for me, um, it's uh, not necessarily like a, like a course to take or anything specific, but I think it's to really kind of be mindful of what it is that you're kind of like consuming or enjoying and why. Like for, for me as a, like a like game designer, author and illustrator, I really try to think about why do I like this illustration or why am I enjoying playing this game or why am I like content reading this book uh, and and thinking about that while either while it's happening or kind of like reflecting on it after um because i think uh i think all that input gets stored somewhere and ends up kind of spilling out into kind of whatever your creative output is that uh if you are thoughtful and going oh i really want to work on more like figure drawing then looking at uh, well, like like taking a figure drawing course or like looking at other artists and illustrators or sculptors that kind of capture the form in a way that you think is really inspiring. Um, or to Adam's point, like finding inspiration in, in kind of careers that are unrelated. Uh, like if 
if what you really like about Bruce Lee's films is kind of his movement then, and you want to kind of capture that in your illustration, then just like go through his, his uh, kind of films and really kind of pay attention to what you're seeing, but then also consider the framing or the cinematography that is like, why is this kind of uh, like working well or how has everyone else worked together to kind of sell this moment? Um, it requires kind of like real like awareness, like a, like a, uh, like a kind of always being on, um, but you can also disengage from that and go like, oh, I'm just going to watch this silly movie just because it, it will make me laugh. You don't always have to kind of have that switch flipped on, but I would suggest if you're going to kind of pursue something, like if you, uh, yeah, if you love playing games, then find the games that you enjoy most and really kind of like think about, oh, why, why do I like playing this video game? Like, what is it that it's doing for me? And how can you take that into kind of what you're doing yourself? So Adam, I hope that kind of commute, like I hope I didn't really kind of misconstrue what you're saying. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. Yeah, I, I kind of refer to that switch you're talking about as my integrity barometer, and so that's kind of, um, you know, I, I've spoken a lot, so I'll let someone else talk. That's a tease right there. That's a <laughs> Nicole Agnes. Did you want to share anything? Go ahead, Agnes. I was trying to type to uh, one of the questions in the chat. I don't know if everyone can see it because it was directed towards me, but I'm Just having a hard time me. like typing and trying to listen to what's happening. Um, is it okay if I just answer this question? By all means, and Nicole turned her mic off on as well. So I assume she might have wanted to say something. Yeah, so like for, when it comes to like, there's a whole bunch of courses you can take. There are a lot of professionals in my industry that are like milliners, dyers, uh, tailors, seamstresses, cutters, like there's, you can go online and you can find a lot of people that are offering workshops and courses, even if it's not something that you're necessarily um, passionate about, but you want to learn more about it. There are a number of times we've had people come to just volunteer um, at the wardrobe just to, cause they love so, or they, they know how to sew and it just kind of makes them feel like they're part of the community, which I think is, I think a lot of different, um, uh, jobs have a lot of different communities that kind of come into play. Um, so if you're creative and coming into like working um, in the wardrobe or the paint department or anything, like there's a lot of a lot of different places that offer apprenticeship programs or co-ops or or things like that. But there are there are a ton of courses you can find online. The cutter I've worked with for the last 15 years, um, she has an amazing has had an amazing career of many different things. But she's constantly taking courses and she's 65. Like she never stops learning. I love taking classes to just to learn something new about how to do it you know my job even better or in a different approach that i would never would have thought of so thanks um for for ter in terms of learning and and that i for me if i want to learn something new i'm usually on youtube or <laughs> like just finding tutorials and figuring it out and and it's usually sometimes things have to stew for a while before like that light bulb goes on and and i just find like the more you make the more things make sense when you like try different things like it's just it's all about practice um so if you're constantly practicing you're and yeah for and just for learning uh i would say yeah i do take also professional courses like i'm really like i'm very excited to get into basket making this year so i've signed up for a basket making workshop like so excited <laughs> um, oh, we've been, oh sorry agnes were you finished yeah no worries um and then there was a question that popped up here about uh, financial hardships in running a business. Should we address this one? <laughs> That'd be great. Yep, go for cool. it. Cool. Um, so yes, running a business is very, uh, many challenges. Uh, have I ever faced ideas that have failed and led to financial downfall? And how do I face these hardships? So uh, I would say the pandemic was definitely uh, completely devastated our of my business. Um, so I have not been able to take a salary um, this past year. I won't be able to this year because we make our money from summer camp and we haven't been running it. Um, and I've tried, um, you know, pivoting. So the business model has completely 180. Whereas in the past, you, you open up registration for summer camp, people sign up, um, and you have that money in your bank months in advance. Uh, you know how much, uh, how many supplies to purchase, how many people to hire. And then, uh, so 
since we started doing kits, it's a complete 180. I'm having to purchase all my inventory ahead of time. I have to store it somewhere. So right now it's in my second bedroom, like floor to ceiling boxes. Uh, I have to hire people to produce the content and do the video editing and all that good stuff, but that's all like money spent up front. And then you're just kind of hoping uh, that people will buy what you've made. So I would say, yes, it's been complete. It's been very, very hard. Um, and I'm relying on government grants and um, loans and, and things like that to get us through it. Um, but I've got hope for the future, you know, that summer, the ne next summer will happen with in-person stuff. But yeah, it's been exhausting, like trying to like continually trying to reinvent things, like put some, make something up, put it out there, see if people like it. Um, and I'm just like, constantly like yeah worrying about it so it's been pretty pretty uh pretty hard this past couple of years I would say anyone else <laughs> feel the same way yeah I think um the creative world got really I mean the entire world got hit with this but I think the creative world got hit first um I remember we were doing when when 2020 happened you could kind of start hearing things during 2019 Christmas and then 2020 happened and we were putting up um, a few good men and kinky boots and we had meetings every week about where the world was at and um, if we should go forward and um, what we were going to do so I know like with, with Drayton Entertainment specifically I had been off work since March of 2020 I went back in the summer of 2021 for three months. We were moving our stock from one place to another, but that was like government grants. Um, and then even doing this business, like the, every time we lock down, I have to rely on my clients being able to kind of pin things the way they want it to be pinned and hope that it's correct because I'm not allowed to have them in for a fitting or um, get their, their loved ones to do it and just cross our fingers and temporarily like do a fix and then give it back to them and then back you know they, they give it back to me to make sure it's right so that back and forthness really kind of cuts into what I can do because it it takes time to go okay is you know I, I can't just go from a to z by myself with a fitting I have to go a b c d and I can't charge people even more for that because that's not fair we're all going through this and so you kind of you sit there and you, you, you take a little bit of a loss but it at the end of the day, when people are happy with the alterations that they've received and they've breathed new life into their stuff, it makes me feel happy about it. So it's kind of the way I've been able to limp, limp along, I guess you could call it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle, but you know, it's fingers crossed. We're all, we're all back doing what we love soon. <laughs> There's a question in the uh, Q and A here that, um, it's another one that I could take live if, if, if that's okay. This one punches a particular button for me. So yeah, this go is, for it, Adam. All right. Uh, so this question, this is the big one. This is why we're all here. This is what's on everyone's mind. How do you stay confident in your passions and career choices when you may not have the support of your family members? Some people would encourage to, inv to avoid pursuing the arts or look down on those jobs. So sometimes it's hard not to doubt yourself. So, um, yeah, it seems like there's this two tiered sort of choice that people can make. They can choose a uh, stable career or they can choose a career in the arts, which is always sort of shrouded with these dark clouds of uncertainty over top of it. Like somehow you're you're choosing a life to be of destitution and loneliness, you know, and that somehow this other choice is a very well considered smart choice filled with stability and happiness um so that's the first myth that i think that we need to dispel it's possible for you to fail at just about anything including these super stable jobs um and the i was very lucky to have a very supportive family in my pursuit of of my my career but that wasn't necessarily the case at school for me i had a lot of interactions with uh, guidance counselors that went something to the effect of, well, do you know how few people make it as a musician? Do you know how few people play behind a, uh, you know, at the time they were using references like Madonna or Sting or like big artists at the time, you know, it's... and I had friends that were also pursuing athletics and they heard the same thing. It's like, do you know how few people make it to be the starting quarterback for the 
New England Patriots or whatever. And somehow we, for some reason, we measure success in the arts as attaining the highest possible level of whatever it is that you're aspiring to. But we don't do that with everything else. If someone says, I'd like to go into medicine, we don't say to that student, well, do you know how few people become the head of oncology at such and such a hospital or whatever? Or if someone says, I'd like to go in politics, nobody says, well, do you know how few people become the prime minister of Canada? For some reason, um, we don't use that same sort of uh, high water benchmark to uh, measure success. We understand that, say, in medicine or in politics, there are many fulfilling, successful careers at all levels um, of that particular industry. And the same is true for the arts. To decide that you want to be a musician um, uh, or, or, or an artist, uh, an author, uh, that's not to say that if you're not a Pulitzer Prize winning author that somehow you have failed or fallen short. There's like many, many levels of success and happiness and fulfillment and purpose and belonging that are all available to you. Um, and so I can imagine that without the support of a family, that's very, very hard. Um, and it's definitely going to likely continue to be a challenge. And um, I mean, for my, my father was his line was basically, uh, you know, you can be a you can be a musician if you want to, but make sure you put in a full day's work. And that was something that stayed with me. You know, uh, every day I get up and it might be practice or it might be my accounting or it might be working on a website or it might be booking the next tours or or even just maintenance of my equipment or whatever but every day i show up and i go to work i put in a full day's work at my craft um and when my father started seeing that i think he started to come around to the idea that oh this is actually this is a job this is a real job and um and yeah but that measure of success um and the understanding that it's an industry it's not just a you know you're either starting port point guard for you know, the New York Knicks, um, or you're a complete and total failure. There's lots of people who make wonderful careers in athletics that never attain that level either. So um, that would be the type of conversation that I maybe would start having with your family members, um, suggesting that this is a very large industry and there's place for everyone in it. I'm gonna suggest just because of time here, I wish that we could hear that uh, eloquence from we had time to hear that eloquence from each of you here, but uh, I wonder if, if folks want to build on that, you're welcome to. But if you also want to kind of give your last uh, uh, your last comment, you can also do so maybe answering this question that's come through. Um, uh, the question is, what one piece of advice would you give to your grade nine self, knowing what you know now? Um, there's also, you know, there are some other questions, unfortunately, here that we ha won't have a chance to, to ask. I think a lot of them have been touched on in different ways. Um, if, if anyone does want to type in it into anything, um, you're welcome to, but uh, I'll leave I'll leave folks with kind of an opportunity to answer this last question as, as we wrap up here. What one piece of advice would you give to your grade nine self knowing what you know now? And if anyone wants to chime in first, I'll take the floor. I'll, I'll speak up to, to this quickly. And I think uh, in, at the very beginning when I was talking about my career uh, or kind of like the changes that I had gone through, I think what I would tell myself in grade nine was uh, you're, you're not going to figure it out right away. And I think what you choose now isn't set in stone. Uh, and I think I would tell that to my grade 12 self, to my third year college self, to myself yesterday. Like, I think it's important to keep in mind that you can always kind of change and evolve. Uh, like, I really thought I was going to be a graphic designer and teach when I was 65. Uh, and that none of that none of that came true. I, it came, like in different ways, but like it, like my the path that I thought I was going to follow, it didn't happen. But I don't regret any of it. Like I think it's okay to change from what you kind of have, kind of like in your head as an expectation. As long as you're kind of like still enjoying it or kind of like finding something that you're kind of passionate about, then I think it's it's all okay. So I think that's what I tell myself. Grade nine, Andrew, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll just tag on to that to say like joy is kind of my word that I follow. Um, so figure out what it is in life that brings you joy and see if there's a way that you can just continue to follow it down whatever path that you take. I'd say to myself, um, both of the things that Andrew and Agnes just said, but for me, I'd say don't take it so seriously. Um, 
you're going to stumble, you're going to fall. But the important part is how you pick yourself back up again and just keep moving forward. Like that's just keep going with what you love, what you do and, and don't take the world so seriously. Just worry about, you know, your, your life, what's around you and, and find, find the things in your life that bring you joy, like Agnes said, and, and everyone has said, just keep, keep moving forward, which is a Disney quote, by the way. I, Adam, did you want to share anything else? Yeah, I would just, I would echo what everyone's saying. Yeah, it's okay to change your mind. Uh, it's okay to not know in grade nine what you want to do for the rest of your life. I think it's probably healthy to not know in grade nine what you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, you're allowed to change your mind. Um, the plan is evolving and it's fluid and uh, and just and be curious uh, also what Nicole was saying. I think curiosity, that, that would be my word. Be curious. And I'm thinking too, I'm noticing one other question, not that we'll have time to answer it, but uh, someone asked about lack of motivation to start to create something. And I'm just thinking about your responses, you know, it, it really suggests to me, you just, you just need to, you know, again, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, just get started. I think sometimes we get worried about judgment, worried about what people will think. Um, if you don't just start creating, then you might never start. Uh, so um, you have to do it and then keep doing it and keep doing it. I think I heard that from you folks over again, the, the persistence and the willingness to just keep going and you got to start, uh, I guess, uh, as well. Or go eat a great meal or watch a sunset <laughs> or watch an awesome movie. Yeah. You know, like go for a walk, play soccer, like all of your best inspiration is not going to come from staring at a blank page. I can guarantee it. You know, it's like, at least not for me. So yeah, beautiful food and interesting people, interesting places, look at architecture and gorgeous artwork. And um, yeah, you know, like get out of your own head. Oh yeah. Man. Do something that's not, that's, that's different. That's not what you do every day. Cause you're going to find inspiration from, the strangest and awesome and quirkiest of sources that you wouldn't think to normally look for. And that inspiration will move people when you, uh, you know, a, a beautiful meal or you watch a play or you, you know, you just see something so, so beautiful and so honest and so, um, so moving that you're compelled to make your art, that you don't just decide to do it. You're actually compelled to do it. That's what will land with people. People want something that's, authentic and honest it's very in, it's very easy to impress people but it's very difficult to move them and that's what you're going to find watching a sunset rowing a canoe laying in the grass playing with children etc cetera, etc cetera. that's great guys yes speaking of inspiration i feel like uh I, i've definitely taken some from uh from what you folks shared and i think our our participants will have as well um I would like to encourage to uh, all the people listening as well, something that I also heard was um, the, the importance of reflecting on the experiences that you're having. Um, you know, when you're gathering this information and these experiences, you know, thinking consciously about, okay, what can I learn from that? Heard that from a number of people. So I'd say the same is true for tonight. Um, we would encourage you to think about uh, what you heard, uh, what it means for you, and what you might do next. Um, when you sign off, um, you'll actually re there'll be a link uh, that'll come up in your browser, and we'll also email it to you uh, of a of a reflection uh, exercise, a feedback form, what we've created that you can uh, fill out, and it will sort of prompt you to reflect a little bit about what you learned, and also give your feedback to us so that we can learn from uh, from your experience and continue to make these sessions. Uh, uh, better. Uh, our next uh, month's session uh, on October 27th um, will feature another set of community members, uh, folks working in uh, in uh, the skilled trades, uh, which I might add uh, often have a creative uh, uh, hands-on kind of element. So there might be of interest to uh, some folks who have that, uh, looking for a way to have that creative outlet. Um, so uh, We'll send you the link to register if you'd like to join us again for that session as well. That will be included in the email that you'll get um, uh, after tonight. Uh, I, I'll mention as well uh, some of the professions that will be there. Uh, we have a master marine mechanic, uh, an electrician, and um, an automotive service uh, technician assistant as well uh, signed up so far. So hope you'll join us for that next session. 
Uh, before I sign off, I want to say thank you again to our wonderful panelists for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. It uh, really does make a, a big difference. So, so thank you again and uh, enjoy your night uh, to each of you and, and to everyone.